We continue this morning our consideration of the 17th verse in the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In our consideration of this verse, we have been emphasizing the fact that the process of sanctification goes on in us and is maintained in us by God through his word. That is obviously the import of this petition which is here offered by our Lord on behalf of his people. He doesn't merely say sanctify them, but sanctify them through or in thy truth. He prays that we all may be brought into the realm of the truth and to such an extent that the truth will operate upon us. We shall be living in it and it will be working in us and producing its gracious effects and results upon us and in us. And we are now in process of considering this truth which does this. Our Lord further defines it by saying, Thy word is truth. And we are looking at that word. We have come to the conclusion that it's the whole word, that everything in the word conspires to this one end, that there is no part of the word truly considered and understood which doesn't promote our sanctification. In other words, the truth that sanctifies is not just some little department of truth, one aspect of truth. It's the whole truth, the entire truth, everything, in a sense, which we have in this book which we call the Bible. But uh, having said that it is thus the whole truth, uh, we have indicated further that uh, obviously there are certain big headings, certain big divisions. And uh, last Sunday morning we began our consideration of these divisions. And we found that uh, allowing the word to speak to us, that clearly and obviously the first great section of truth uh, which we must consider is the truth about God himself. And how most of our troubles arise from the fact that we start with ourselves instead of starting with God. The ultimate business of salvation is to bring us to know God. It isn't merely to make us better. It isn't merely to make us happy. There are all sorts of agencies that can do that. The primary object of Christian salvation is to bring men to know God and to know themselves as the children of God and the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You can have religion without God. You can have morality without God. You can have happiness in a sense without God. The specific object and purpose of everything that God has been graciously pleased to do in and through his only begotten Son is to bring us to a knowledge of himself. Our Lord has stated that so plainly in this great chapter that we are considering together. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And whatever we may have experienced, whatever may have happened to us, if we have not this knowledge of God, well then it's doubtful whether we are in a position of salvation at all. And there is certainly no value to any moral or ethical qualities that may belong to us unless they derive centrally from this knowledge. We must start with the doctrine of God. The Bible is a book about God. And man has his being because of God. Everything comes from God and everything goes to God. So that over everything is this great doctrine of God, the truth of the word of God about God himself. Well, having said that and having emphasized that, we now come to the second great section of the truth. And that is, of course, the one which follows by a kind of inevitability and logical necessity from the doctrine of God, namely the doctrine of sin. What the Word has to tell us about sin and about ourselves in a state and condition of sin. If, as I say, salvation ultimately means to know God, 
The great problem is, what is it that separates us from God? And the answer to that is sin. That's the biblical answer. It's nothing else. It isn't a lack of intellectual capacity. It isn't a philosophical inability. The one thing that comes between any one of us and all of us and God is sin. Now that's a great doctrine which you find running right through the Bible. Now I wonder whether we're all prepared to agree once more that here again is an aspect of the truth which for some strange reason we tend to neglect. I feel about this uh, doctrine of sin that we can say about it what I once heard a man saying about the Lord's day and the observance of the Lord's day. He said he had come to the conclusion that the Lord's day, like the Lord himself, was in danger of dying and expiring between two thieves. The two thieves, he said, are Saturday night and Monday morning. That increasingly, uh, Saturday night was extended and extended and extended into Sunday. And then people started there Monday morning, he said, quite early on Sunday evening. Sunday just becomes oh, just a few hours during the morning. Then we say, well, Sunday's finished now. We've been to church once and there's the end of it. And we begin our Monday. And our Lord's day is being lost between the two thieves. I feel that it's equally true to say something like that about this biblical doctrine of sin. And it seems to me to be happening in this way. When we're dealing with the unconverted, we tend to say to them, ah, oh, you needn't worry about sin now. That'll come later. All you need to do is to come to Christ or to give yourself to Christ. Don't, don't worry your head about sin. Of course, you can't understand that now. All that will develop later. Don't you worry whether you've got a sense of sin or deep conviction and you, uh, whether you understand these things or not. All you need to do is to come to Christ and to give yourself to Christ and then you'll be very happy. That's one aspect. Then when we're dealing with those who have so come, our tendency to say to them is, but of course you, you mustn't look at yourself now. You must look to Christ. Uh, you, you mustn't be uh, analyzing yourself. That's what you did before you were converted. You were thinking in terms of yourself and what you've got to do. And the only thing you've got to do is to uh, keep looking to Christ and away from yourself. And we imagine, therefore, that all that is needed by Christians is a certain amount of comfort and of encouragement, uh, preaching about the love of God and about the general providence of God and perhaps a certain amount of moral and ethical exhortation. And so, you see, the doctrine of sin is, as it were, crowded out. We don't emphasize it before conversion, and we don't emphasize it after conversion. And the result of it all is that we hear very little at all about it. Now, uh, whether we agree with my explanation or not, I think we all must agree with the fact. The doctrine of sin has been sadly and grievously neglected. We know that instinctively we none of us like it. And thus it comes to pass, I say, that this doctrine is so little emphasized and so little has been heard of it. And yet when you come to the Bible, as I say, you find it everywhere. And of necessity, it should be central for these reasons. Why should anybody come to Christ? What do they do when they come to Christ? What do they mean when they say that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? How can that possibly happen apart from some understanding of sin? You can't give yourself or your heart to Christ. You can't surrender to him. You can't, to use the phrase, take him as your savior. Unless you know what he's to save you from. So that surely it is unscriptural, utterly unscriptural to indulge in any sort of evangelism apart from the doctrine of sin. There is no real meaning or content to the term saviour or salvation apart from this doctrine of sin, which has this tremendous emphasis in the Bible from beginning to end. Our fathers, uh, perhaps I should say our grandfathers, and those who preceded them, the older evangelicalism, always laid great emphasis on what it called 
a law work. It emphasized the importance of a thoroughgoing law work before you came to the gospel and its redemption. And they were very distrustful always of those who claimed salvation except in terms of a thoroughgoing preliminary law work. And as you read their lives, you will find that they have a great deal to say about the plague of their own hearts. Now, if you read of saintly men like Robert Murray McChain and men of that generation and men who preceded that generation, the men of the 18th century, you'll find that that was their language. That was their terminology. And as I say, it's a language and a terminology that has somehow or another dropped out. And I think it has done so in the way that I've been indicating. But after all, whatever they may have said and thought, the fact by which we are confronted is that this is something that is found in the Bible, everywhere, in the Old Testament and in the New. You can't get away from it. It's a doctrine that permeates the whole book, runs right through the whole teaching. And it is for that reason that we have to consider it. I'm suggesting that it is absolutely vital and essential to a true understanding of sanctification that we should know something about the biblical doctrine of sin. It is only as we realize the truth about ourselves and our condition, it is only as we come to realize our ultimate need that we apply to Christ who alone can supply it. In other words, there is surely nothing in experience that so drives one to Christ as the realization of one's need and of one's helplessness. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Isn't that it? It's because I'm foul I fly to the fountain. If I don't realize my need of being washed, I won't go to the fountain. Naked, come to thee for dress, helpless, look to thee for grace. These things of necessity go together. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. You don't go to your doctor if you feel perfectly well. You never make any kind of application for any kind of healing or redemption or salvation unless you're conscious of your need of it. And that, of course, is the whole trouble with the world today. It doesn't realize this need. That's why it doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the same thing is true in principle of the converted and of the Christian. It is those who realize their condition and their need most deeply are the ones who apply most constantly to the Lord himself. Now, this is the universal testimony of the saints. It doesn't matter when they lived, where they lived. It doesn't matter what century they belonged to. You read the life of any saint of God. Anyone who so stood out in saintliness that uh, somebody felt it right and good and fitting that a biography should be written of him or of her, and you'll find that invariably this has been a characteristic of such a person. You read their lives and you find, if you read their diaries, that they bemoaned the fact that there was sin still in them, indwelling sin. Yes, this plague of their own heart, as they called it. This thing in them that was vitiating uh, so often their testimony and hampering what they really desired to be and to do for the law. It's invariable. Those who have testified to the most high and glorious and thrilling experiences have always at the same time testified to this other thing. Indeed, the life of the Christian seems to be some sort of an ellipse which works and runs between these two focal points. At one and the same time, you always find in the saint a hearty detestation of self, a misery about self, and yet a rejoicing and a joy in the Lord, and the one of necessity determines the other. Well then, here I say is something that is found thus in general, everywhere in the scriptures and in the testimony of God's people throughout the centuries. But let us be a little bit more particular. Uh, this is the truth, I say, 
which the word of God teaches us. It teaches us about God, then it teaches us about sin. And that's the way in which it sanctifies us. Let me ask a question, therefore. What are the ways in which it presents this particular aspect of the truth? I'm not going to deal with it exhaustively. I'm going to give you some of the most obvious uh, general divisions. The first way in which the, the scriptures, the word of God, uh, teach this is, of course, by means of the teaching about the law. The law of God. Now there is great teaching about the law, the law of God in the Bible. A law was originally given to men in the Garden of Eden. The scriptures tell us that there is a law written on the heart of every person born into this world, that even the heathen who have never heard this scripture have got the law of God written in their hearts. Paul, you remember, teaches that in the second chapter of the epistle to the Romans. And then, of course, it's here in the Bible in a very special way, in terms of the law that was given through Moses to the children of Israel. There you get the account of it given in the book of Exodus. Then you get constant references to it. You get the references in the Psalms. You get it running right through the prophets. They're in a sense doing nothing but applying this law that was given, reminding the nation of it. It's everywhere in the Old Testament. And indeed it's true to say that we just cannot understand the Old Testament and its message unless we are clear about the place and the function of the law of God in it. And you come to the New Testament and you find it there again everywhere. These constant arguments concerning the law. What is their meaning? What's their purpose? If we don't really understand what the law is. Now, the, the law, I say, is given primarily in order to bring out these two points about the holiness of God and the consequent sinfulness of men in the light of that holiness. It's very interesting to observe in this connection the way in which the Jews completely misunderstood that. The real trouble with the Jews, as Paul especially is never tired of arguing, the real trouble with them was that they entirely misinterpreted the meaning of the law. They thought the purpose of the law was this, that God gave them the law and in effect said to them, now you keep that and you'll be saved. You save yourselves by keeping the law. And they persuaded themselves that they'd done so. They conveniently misinterpreted it. And then they carried out their own misinterpretation and they said, we've kept the law and we are just before God. That was the very essence of their error. The purpose and the function of the law was really, as Paul argues in this seventh chapter of Romans, which we read at the beginning, to show the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear, sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The law was not given in order to save men, or that men might save himself by it. It was given really for one purpose only, and it was this, that sin might be defined that sin, as it were, might have attention focused upon it. Mankind didn't realize its sinfulness, so God gave the law, not that they might save themselves by keeping it, but that their very sinfulness should be brought out. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That's its only function, to show us our helplessness, to show us our need of grace and of a further salvation. It cannot save by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, those are the scriptural statements about the law. In other words, I'm reminding you that the great purpose of the law is to teach us this doctrine concerning the sinfulness of sin. And in every place, wherever it is applied and elaborated, that is exactly what it does. So all this great biblical teaching about the law is simply to bring out in us a sense of sin. And therefore it follows, doesn't it, of necessity that if we've never really studied this biblical doctrine of the law, if we've never applied it to ourselves, if we're not doing so constantly, 
well then we are not aware of our own sinfulness as we should be. That is what the fathers meant by a thoroughgoing law work. It is only as I truly face the law of God that I begin to see what I am. That's the argument again of the seventh of Romans. That's one way in which it does it. Then, of course, coming to the New Testament, you get it in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, in its essence, is an explication and an exposition of God's law. It's our Lord showing us the real spiritual content of the law, showing its spiritual nature, denouncing the false interpretation of the Pharisees, and really bringing us to see it. And why? Well, again, surely the object is this. It's to bring us to see and to realize our sinfulness. The object of the Sermon on the Mount is to disabuse all ideas about human self-righteousness. It was an exposure of the Pharisees and scribes and all who tended to follow them. In a sense, the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to bring us into a condition in which we shall be poor in spirit, in which we shall mourn, in which we shall hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's its object. It's to bring us into the position and the state of those described by the Beatitudes. In other words, it's again a realization of our sinfulness. And then you get the same teaching, of course, in the epistles. That's the meaning of these discussions and arguments about the law. That's the meaning of the teaching about the old men and the new men and the flesh and the law of sin and death and so on. You find this constantly in the New Testament epistles. You find it in their exhortations. Their exhortations to the people to examine themselves, to prove them their own selves, to make certain that they're in the faith, to test the spirits, to avoid the false, to hold fast only to that which is true. All that is really a part of the teaching concerning sin. Very well then, that is the way in general in which you find this doctrine about sin presented in the scriptures. That leads me to ask my second question. What then in particular is this teaching about sin? If that's the way in which it's presented in general, what does it say in particular? Now, obviously, I'm dealing with it this morning solely from the standpoint of Christians and of believers. I should be emphasizing certain other things if I were presenting it to the unbeliever. I'm particularly concerned now about the biblical teaching concerning sin with regard to God's people. And here there are certain principles which stand out very clearly. The first is the vital and essential distinction between sin and sins. The trouble is generally with a false doctrine of sin that it tends to think of sin only in terms of actions. Now there have been many false schools of teaching about holiness which have been uh, wrong and false entirely because they have defined sin only in terms of particular actions. And therefore they have said that as long as we are not guilty of those actions, voluntary, willful sin, we are perfect and we are entire and fully sanctified. But the Bible draws this very sharp distinction between particular actions and a sinful state and condition. And its emphasis is not so much upon what we do as upon the condition which leads us to do it. That's a broad principle that it lays down everywhere. That it is not merely the things we do, but it is what we are. Then conversely, you see, or putting it the other way around, it puts its emphasis upon being rather than doing, in a positive sense. The Christian, the, the, the true Christian, is not so much a man who does certain things as a man who is something, and because he is, he does. It's being, it's condition, rather than actions. Another way in which it puts this uh, general principle is that it teaches us that uh, sin primarily is a wrong attitude towards God and a wrong relationship towards him. Again, you see that its way of defining sin is not merely in terms of the moral ethical character of the action. No, before that and in its essence, 
Sin is a wrong relationship to God and a wrong attitude towards God. So that sin really defined comprehensively is anything or everything that prevents our living only to God and for him and for his glory. Those who say that uh, sin uh, ultimately means self are, of course, perfectly right. They are right as far as they go, but they don't go far enough. Sin is self, and sin is self-centeredness and selfishness. Yes, but the real trouble about selfishness and self-centeredness is this. Not so much that I am self-centered as that I am not God-centered. You see, you can have your philosophical and moral and ethical teachings which will denounce selfishness. All your uh, idealistic systems, all your programs for utopia are always very careful to denounce selfishness and self-centeredness. Obviously, you cannot have a well-ordered society if everybody is out for himself or herself. There must be give and take. They say you must consider the other person. And you must put a certain limit upon you of freedom in order that the other person may enjoy freedom. So you can denounce self as such and still be far removed from the biblical doctrine of sin. Self in all its forms is sinful, says the Bible, because it puts self where God ought to be. Now, if you start with that definition of sin, you see how comprehensive it becomes. Take that Pharisee, for instance, who thanked God that he was not like other people. Up to a point, he was quite honest and truthful in what he said. He wasn't guilty of certain things, and he did other things. Yes, but he stopped at this. If he had realized that the essence of sin is to fail to be in the right relationship to God, or to have the right attitude to God, he would have realized his sinfulness. There are many Christian people, I less, who are very careful not to commit certain external sins. But they're not quite so careful about pride and about self-satisfaction and about smugness and about glibness. They're not quite so careful about rivalry and jealousy within their own Christian organizations. No, no, they've forgotten all that. Self is in the ascendant even in their work at times instead of God. But because they think of sin only in terms of actions and have forgotten that it's primarily a relationship to God, they're not aware of their sinfulness. But that is the very essence of sin, not to live entirely and wholly to the glory of God. And it matters not how good we may be, nor how much better we may be than other people. If I am not loving the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength, I am a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the biblical teaching. And the other great principle concerning it is this. That sin is something which is deep down in our natures. It isn't something on the surface. It isn't a lack of culture, a lack of knowledge, a lack of instruction. It isn't uh, something uh, like just a little speck on the surface, on the, on the skin of an otherwise perfect apple. No, no, it's at the center, it's in the core. It isn't merely something in the stream. It's in the fountain out of which the stream comes. It's something which is central in a man's being and life. Now that is emphasized, as you realize, everywhere in the scripture. It refers to it as a principle. That's the whole meaning of the term the flesh. It doesn't mean the physical body. It means a principle in a man's life that tends to be contrary. Indeed, the Bible says that sin is so deep in men that uh, nothing can possibly rid him of it or deliver him from it except a rebirth. Teaching isn't enough. Exhortation is not enough. Example is not enough. Even the example of Christ is not enough. In a sense, it damns more than anything else. There is only one hope, says the scripture. You must be born again. You must be made and created anew. Sin is so deep down in human nature that man needs a new nature. Sin indeed is as deep a problem as this, that nothing but the incarnation and all our Lord did can possibly deal with it. It's as profound 
and as deep a problem as that. And therefore we have to realize that though we are Christians and have received the new nature, the problem is still there because of the old nature. We haven't finished with it. Well, there I suggest are the three main controlling principles. But still we must divide that up just a little further. If that is the truth about sin, how does it rarely show itself? And this seems to be the teaching. First and foremost, it is what is always described as missing the mark. Not being at the place where you ought to be. You're shooting and you've just missed the mark, or you're traveling and you don't arrive at the exact destination. Now, that is, of course, of the very essence of the biblical understanding of sin. It's an absence of righteousness. It's an absence of holiness. Every sinner is not what he ought to be. We are not as we came out of the hands of God. We are not reflecting the glory of God as we were meant to do. We are not still as we were when man was made in God's image. The image has been marred. Something has gone. There's a failure to be what we are meant to be. You see the importance of regarding sin in that way? The man who realizes that that is a primary part of the definition of sin is a man who realizes that he's still a sinner. But if you're simply looking at drunkards and prostitutes, or simply looking at certain particular actions, of course you're all right and you're not conscious of sin. And you're not humble and you don't mourn. You're self-satisfied and content and you're looking down at other people. But once you realize that we are meant to be holy and to be righteous, and that we are not that, then you realize at once that you're a sinner. But it's not only that. It's not merely this negative condition of not being righteous and holy. It is also actual transgression of the law. You remember John's argument about that in his first epistle and in the third chapter. Sin, he says, is transgression of the law. Breaking the commandments of God. Doing what is wrong. Sin is disobedience. And the Bible emphasizes this quite as much as the other. Our trouble is not only that we are not what we ought to be, but that we deliberately are and do things that we should not do. It is a breaking of the law, a disobedience of the commandment, a transgression, a cutting across what God has indicated as his holy will. Yes, but it's something even worse than that. It is what is described as concupiscence. You noticed uh, that uh, word coming in this reading of the seventh of Romans at the beginning of this morning. And it is something that we must always watch, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead. What does this mean? Well, this is the biblical way of describing desire. Evil desire. The trouble with us is not simply that we break the law and transgress and do things that are wrong. The trouble with us is that we ever want to do that. That it ever gives us pleasure to do that. That there's ever an inclination to do that. That there's something in us that makes that appeal to us. That's concupiscence partly. But you know, it's even worse than that. Concupiscence is as terrible and as foul a thing as this. That even the law of God inflames it. Did you notice Paul's argument? He said, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Is then the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the Lord said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. The commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, 
that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. All that means this. There is this terrible thing called concupiscence in men. And it works in this way. You tell a man, you tell a child, you tell anybody not to do a thing. Now that's a good thing to say. It's a good thing to tell people not to do that which is wrong and to tell them to do that which is good. Yes, says Paul, but this is what I found and we've all found the same thing. That the very commandment which tells me not to do that evil thing by drawing my attention to me inflames my desire to do it. So that the very law of God leads me to sin. It isn't because the law isn't right and good and just and holy, says Paul. God forbid that anybody should say that. Well, what's the matter? Oh, it's this awful thing in me called concupiscence. It'll even turn good into evil. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those that are not pure, there's nothing pure. That is why as a Christian I've never believed in morality teaching. That is why I've never believed in those who argue, tell people the evil effects of that sin and it'll keep them from it. No, it won't. If they're sinful, it'll inflame their desire for the very thing that you're telling them not to do. And that is why people quite often delude and fool themselves in reading books about such things. They say that what they want to do, of course, is to see the evil of the thing. What is often happening is that they're rather enjoying it. They're sinning in their minds and in their imagination. That's what's meant by concupiscence. This passion, this flame, this fire. And even the law of God becomes a kind of bellows that makes the flame burst. Tell a man not to. It may drive him to do it. You're introducing it to him. So it's a dangerous thing with fallen men to think and to imagine that moral instruction about sex and such things is going to control the moral problem. It's having the exact opposite effect. And to believe in that kind of teaching is to misunderstand the essential biblical teaching about sin. No, our fathers were right. They didn't tell their children about sex and about morality and such things. And there was less immorality than there is now. It's a dangerous thing to talk about these things. It's like pouring petrol into fire. Concupiscence. That's the great argument of the seventh of Romans. Finally, I must put it in these words. It shows itself, says Paul, as a kind of law in my life and in my members. Do you notice him talking about the law in his members? I delight in the law of God after the inward men, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, sin, that's sin. You see, it's a terrible power. It's a great principle. It's a veritable law, says Paul. And it works in this way. Even though we know, may know that the law of God is right and good and just and holy and believe in it and even want to keep it, we find that we're doing something else. Why? Well, it's because there is another law in our members. It's this thing called the flesh. Uh, therefore, he comes to the conclusion that in me, that is to say in my flesh, which doesn't mean the physical body, it means this principle of sin. This law of sin, this law in the members, they're all synonymous terms. It's this thing that governs me. So that though I want to do that, and with my mind subscribe to it and love it, I nevertheless find myself doing the other thing. Well, that is in its essence, as I see it, the biblical teaching with regard to sin. And we know it's true. Yes, but my friends, how often do we think about this? How often do we meditate upon it? How often do we search ourselves and examine ourselves to see how guilty we are of these things? Are we dismissing these things lightly, br brushing them away, not rarely facing them? The scriptures exhort us to face them. That's why it puts the law before us everywhere. We need to be kept down. We need to be humbled. We need to be convicted of sin. And it is only as we are that we shall realize the need of sanctification. 
It is only as we are we shall fly to Christ and seek his face and seek God. It is only as we are that we shall thank God that the whole of salvation from beginning to end is God's work and not ours. It will deliver us out of this superficial dealing with the problem in terms of actions. It will enable us to see our true condition as sold under sin, governed by the law of sin and death, doomed and condemned and hopeless, and needing that mighty operation of the Spirit of God which, blessed be his name, gives us new life and a new birth, and then proceeds by the application of this blessed word in us and upon us to perfect us until eventually, because it is his work and his power, we shall stand before him faultless and blameless and with exceeding joy. God grant us an increasing understanding of the biblical teaching, the word of God's teaching about sin, that it may drive us to Christ. Amen. to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy 
to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now, throughout the remainder of this our short and certain life, and earthly pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.